Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good whenever you happen to be watching this video. I hope it finds you well. Today we're going to be talking about Genesis chapter 29 and also chapter 30, which is the story of how Jacob marries his two wives and then his two maidservants. We're not really going to go through the passage that much. I think there's three questions from this story that emerge that are, I think, of relevance to us. The first uh, question that emerges is, what do we make of this uh, parallelism between Isaac and Jacob? How Isaac is blind, and so then he blesses Jacob when he thinks it's Esau, just as Jacob at night is deceived, and so he marries Leah instead of Rachel. What do we, what do we make of this? Does this then dethrone the idea that Jacob is still to be seen as an example of virtue? We're going to look at that question. We're also going to answer this question of uh, polygamy. What do we make of Jacob and his four wives? And what does God have to say about this topic? And then thirdly, I think we're going to examine an interesting question, at least one that is of interest to me, which is what about Jacob and Leah's relationship as a whole? How does it end up at, at the end of it all? How, how does it work out between them? Does it does it work out between them? We're going to be answering that question as well. How about we open with a, the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So our narrative picks up with Jacob arriving from Bethel, and upon his arrival, he sees these shepherds that are connected to Laban, and they're waiting for Rachel to show up, Laban's daughter, and Rachel shows up, Jacob is immediately smitten with her, he's in love with her, and he demonstrates his love by moving this big rock all by himself. He shows his great strength, something really seems only he was capable of doing as a single man. Now, Laban then meets Jacob after Jacob introduces himself, and Jacob stays with Laban for a month. And in this month, Jacob proves himself to be indispensable, useful, and excellent asset to Laban's Household. So Laban is inclined to try and keep Jacob on for longer. And so they shake hands. They agree that Jacob will work for seven years. And at the close of those seven years, he will have Rachel, the one he loves, that he saw that was beautiful, as his bride. The seven years pass quickly for Jacob because of his love. A long time, it seems to me, to work for one bride. And then on the wedding night, when all is supposed to be well, Laban does a switch, and it's Leah there instead of Rachel. Jacob confronts Laban for this and gets angry with him, and then Laban makes up some excuse, custom, blah, 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 this, blah, 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 that. And then he essentially strong arms Jacob into agreeing to work another seven years for Rachel. And so then after he marries Leah, one week later, he takes Rachel as his wife. After Jacob marries uh, Rachel, he serves Laban for another seven years. And it seems that these seven years is the time period where all his children are born. And for us this week, that is where the narrative stops. And that's Genesis 29 to 30. We'll now approach our first question. The first question we're uh, dealing with is what do we make of Laban's deception of Jacob? It seems very parallel to Jacob's own deception of his father, and Laban's deception is wickedness indeed. And so because Laban's uh, deception is wicked, perhaps we should see Jacob as incredibly wicked in that past narrative instead of viewing him strongly. And while it is true that this is a case of parallelism, I think this actually proves what we established the previous week with regards to how we should see Jacob in his t in his uh, moment of deception with his father. That there was a sin committed, but the sin was small compared to the good of the person. So for example, Leah is really the one who deceives 
uh, Jacob, not Laban. But no scolding is given to Leah. She is not seen as unrighteous in any way. And the text in no way makes her seem like a bad person. And neither does Jacob. Jacob doesn't blame Leah. He doesn't say anything mean to her. And he doesn't mistreat her, it would appear, at least uh, in an in an in an outright way. Instead, he goes straight to Laban. That's the person he blames for this situation. He doesn't blame Leah. And so, though it is true, as Cale said, that thus the overreacher of Esau was overreached himself and sin was punished by sin, the parallelism is far greater than just this moment. You see, Isaac's problem was not the deception, but it was that he loved the son according to the flesh more than he loved the son that the spirit had chosen. That was Isaac's struggle. Isaac loved Jacob, the child of God, less than he loved Esau, the son of his flesh, which shows Isaac's struggle with sin. And also it's, you know, just the familial struggle that Isaac had. Because of Esau's game, Isaac loved him. Because of Rachel's beautiful form, Jacob loved her. And Jacob failed to see the virtue in Leah, just as Isaac failed to see the virtue in Jacob, that they were the ones that God had chosen. And so, really, Jacob is following in the footsteps of his father in this narrative in a total way. Leah is the woman God has for Jacob. It's not a punishment for Jacob to end up with Leah. Leah is the one God has for Jacob in his wisdom. That is God working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Leah is the one he should marry. Jacob's sin is that he was not content with the woman God had for him. But of course, because of his situation, we can be sympathetic. We can understand that, you know, that he decided to marry Rachel and in their culture, it was uh, permissible to marry multiple women. Laban seemed to be scheming this idea from the beginning. And so Jacob steps deeper into sin. But we really need to realize that Leah is the woman of promise. She's the woman of destiny. She's the woman that God has selected for the chosen man. Because monogamy is the plan from the beginning. There's Adam and there's Eve, the one. And there's a chosen man and one chosen woman. And they are bound together. And any outsiders are not welcome. That's what we see with Abraham and with Sarah. They are meant to be bound together. No outsiders are welcome. God's plan is always monogamy and his plan is always not for divorce. And it is a sin for another party to enter into a marital arrangement. And so this is why Abraham ends up having to send away Hagar. And so the Bible has already established, I think at this point, that Leah, the first wife, is the woman of destiny for Jacob. And they are bound together because she is the person of promise. We, we can't forget this. And so then as we move past this, we then, I think really nicely, transition into this question of polygamy. It is clear, as I have mentioned before, that Jacob sinned in acquiring multiple wives. Even though in his acquiring of many wives, the Bible, I think, is clear that he still didn't treat Leah poorly. He didn't um, uh, kick her out of his household. He didn't mistreat her. He lived according to the minimum standards of the law of Exodus. But God's standards are much higher than that. So though he married many wives, in God's eyes, those marriages were not legitimate. They were sinful marriages, and the only one he recognized was Leah's. And this is shown to us in the narrative. It is not when Jacob takes two rival wives that God gets really upset with him. It's not when uh, Jacob rejects Leah that God gets really upset with him and he ends up marrying Rachel. It's not even when he takes those maidservants that God really expresses displeasure with the situation. The moment where God reveals his heart towards the situation is when it is revealed that Jacob does not love Leah, that he does not love her. The Bible says because she was unloved, the Lord opened her womb. And because of this, he closed fast the womb of Rachel. So Rachel is an intruder into the marriage that God had for Jacob. She is the adulterous woman who looks beautiful on the outside, but when she comes in, brings with her uh, death. Now, this is all, you know, spiritual allegory. It is not to say that Rachel is a bad person. Far from it. 
God blesses Rachel with a wonderful son, Joseph, who becomes the most righteous of all of Jacob's sons. So what we see is though God is opposed to polygamy and he sees it as a sin because it is a destructive sin, just as divorces and all these other sins are, yet it does not mean that though we sin, there is no room for God's grace in our lives. In fact, that Rachel's son, Joseph, is the favored son of all, is the greatest proof of God's love and mercy towards Jacob and how God overlooks wrongs. And this is why it is so dangerous to judge whether an action is right or wrong based on whether it brings a good result. Because God's love and his mercy is so great that he'll give you a good result many times when we don't deserve it. And it's hard sometimes, I think, to remember that. So to sum it all up, we see that Jacob sinned in taking multiple wives. Jesus confirms this, one man, one woman. However, through his sin, God still blessed him. And the greater sin beyond this is that he didn't love Leah. That is the thing God found truly disgusting in his sight. And that is why the New Testament explicitly says that divorce is because of hardness of heart. And that we are commanded to love our wives as husbands, as spouses. Now, as Jesus knows, as Moses knows, and as the law provides, there are always difficult situations that God's grace covers. But the standard remains the same, and it can be quite a challenge. Sometimes, you know, years later in our lives, people have regret over the people they married, the people they're with. But we'll deal with this in the later section, our devotional, to which we now turn. The subject of marriage in the Bible is a difficult subject, not, I think, just because of the requirements of the Mosaic law on marriage, which are many, there's many laws that govern it, but it's the requirement of the heart, the requirement of the heart. But on the outset, I just want to make clear Jacob is an example to us that though we have sinned, that we have mistakes, there is a way to behave. You know, even though he marries two wives, God wouldn't want him to then throw away Leah to nothing, right? He shouldn't just abandon her. And so there are people, I think, who say have divorced or whatever, and they become married, and then they think like so there's some people who struggle like, oh, maybe I should go back. God doesn't want you to add sin to sin. And in fact, this is what the Bible says, that we shouldn't go back and undo our second marriages and things like this. The Lord sees them, the Lord recognizes them, and the Lord blesses them with his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. We ought not agonize continually over our sins. As we can see with Jacob, he had many sins, but God did not agonize over them. He still blessed him. But the one that is the most difficult for Jacob is loving Leah. And the Bible says very clearly that he loved Rachel, at what point, though, if there was a point, did he end up loving his wife, Leah? Well, I think the Bible gives us a hint. When God sees that Leah is unloved, he closes Rachel's womb. So in my view, the moment when Leah's womb is opened is the moment that Jacob loves his wife, Leah. That's what I think. That's my reading of the passage. That's when Jacob finally gave his heart to Leah and he loved her. The text confirms at least that at the end of his life and long before it, because Leah predeceased Jacob, it seems, by quite a while, his heart already fully belonged to Leah, the woman uh, God had for him. Allow me to read this passage from Genesis. Then he gave them these instructions. I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field as a burial place from Ephron the Hittite. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. There I buried Leah. The field and the cave in it were bought from the Hittites. When Jacob had finished giving instructions to his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed, breathed his last, and was gathered to his people. In his last moments and with his last breath, Jacob was really careful to mention Leah by name and express his desire to remain with her forever in death. If that's not a deep statement of love, I don't know what is. And clearly this moment happened long before he 
buried her or else why would he bury her in that place? And so at our time of devotional, I think what we want to recognize is that God does not seek for obedience according to the law, which is what many Christians struggle with. The question we face as people who maybe have um, committed fornication, had sex outside of marriage before we married, say, the person we ended up marrying, people who divorce and remarry and all these questions. God doesn't want you to rake through your mind, to dig up your sins and you know all this stuff. God meets us at the present where we are. And at the present, the question he asks is, what is going on in your heart? Doesn't matter which marriage you're on, which person you're with, or how many people you were with before your spouse or whatever. What matters is, do they have your heart? The Bible commands, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church with his entire life. He gave his life for his church. And we should love one another with that deep desire to give our lives for them. And I think that's what Jacob is expressing in this verse with Leah. And so we must not forget that God is the God of the human heart. He sits enthroned in our hearts. He's entered into our hearts and he has given us dominion over them. We are not as those who are non-Christians who cannot control their emotions, who cannot control their feelings, who cannot control their hearts. Our hearts are in subjection to us. God has given us control over them. For one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And this is not a diminishing of love. Just as God giving Leah is not a diminishing. But it is a realization of the blessing we have already received. When Jacob finally opens his eyes to Leah as the woman of destiny, it isn't him settling for second best, but him realizing that he made a big mistake and he already had what was best in front of him. And so I think that the Bible is very clear on our conduct, that God is not looking at our past, at our mistakes, at wherever we came from. He is looking to us in our present. And in our present, the question that is relevant for our devotional is, do you love the people God has given you to love? especially family, especially spouses. For if you do not love that person, how can you love the lover of your soul? If we cannot be faithful in our hearts to the persons we have on earth, how can we be faithful to the person who's waiting for us in heaven? And that's uh, our devotional. I wish you all a good week. I hope it is encouraging to you, and I look forward to seeing you when I see you. Coronavirus in mind and notwithstanding. Hopefully we will meet each other soon. The Lord be with you and have a great week.